All right, everybody, thank you very much for joining us this Saturday morning. I am Zach Ford. I am the chair of the Dusty Baker Sacramento Sabre chapter, and we are very excited to have Lincoln Mitchell with us today. Um, and he's going to be talking about the Giants and their city, which is very near and dear to my heart because it covers the Giants during the Bob Lurie era. And uh, the last few years of that era, late 80s, early 90s, were when I really became a huge baseball fan. So I'm looking forward to having what uh, Lincoln uh, wants to share with us, um, shared today. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Marlene. She's going to have some Sabre announcements and then pass it over to Steve. We'll introduce Thanks, Lincoln. Zach. Nice to see everyone. Some of you again. This is this is great. It's really nice to see your smiling faces, especially some of you I haven't seen in a while. Um, I wanted to remind you it's time to sign up for um, the Summer of Sabre celebration. Um, it's going to be three weekends uh, this summer of virtual uh, conference programming. Um, the weekends are June 25th through 27th, July 23rd through 25th, and August 10th. 10th, 13th, and 14th, I may have copied that wrong, but you can get that information on the saber.org website. There are, there's also currently a little uh, competition running between chapters. Whatever chapter gets the most signups, um, Saber will treat that chapter to a, uh, a lunch once we can meet in person again. So, you know, maybe uh, if we keep joining forces, they'll take care of both of us, both of our chapters together. Um, we're planning a meeting on Tuesday, July 27th, another joint Zoom meeting to celebrate women in baseball. Um, Sherry Davis, the former uh, Giants PA announcer, will be one of our guests. And uh, we've invited some other women who have been uh, important uh, in baseball these days. Uh, one last announcement. Uh, we had invited you to the dedication of a ballpark in honor of Lou Profumo here in uh, San Leandro. That has been postponed. It's not next Saturday. So when we get more information, we will share that with you. And now I'm gonna turn it over to um, Lefty O'Doul chapter co-chair, Steve Tretter. Uh, and thanks again, Steve, for the wonderful presentation on Horace Stoneham last week. Um, and Steve's going to uh, take us to Lincoln. Thanks. Thank you, Marlene. Um, I think one of the greatest things about baseball writing and baseball history is that there's so many great angles uh, from which to, to, to look at it. And among those angles is sort of putting baseball within its context, within social, political, cultural uh, norms. Um, if you've never read Lincoln's earlier book, uh, San Francisco Year Zero, it is a political, social, cultural history of San Fr the San Francisco Bay Area and the Giants through the very turbulent and troubling era of the 70s. Um, it's a terrific book. I really, really love it and, and highly recommend it. And it really, it resonates with me because it, this, this is my time. I was in high school and college through those years. And of course, a diehard Giants fan. And it was such a, a weird and, and exciting and kind of scary time to, to live through. Uh, and Lincoln just captures it wonderfully. It's it's really good. So I have not yet read Lincoln's newest book. Trust me, it's on my it's on my to do list. But I'm really looking forward to it. It's I think it's really going to be a treat, not just for baseball fans, but for for Bay Area people who who really you know want to understand what this what this cultural and social and political uh, amalgamation of of things is. So Lincoln, take it away, please. Well, thank you. And thank you for those very kind words, Steve. It's always great to learn that someone besides my mother is reading my books, let alone enjoying them. So thank you. Um, and thank you, Marlene and Zach, for, for organizing this. I wish we could be there in person, but, but maybe next time. I also want to recognize my, my really perhaps my oldest friend in the world, Charles Fracchia, who was on the call, Justice Charles. I guess he maybe can't spell his last name or something. But, uh, and, this is, uh, and the reason I want to recognize Charles, besides that he's, we've been friends since 1971, is that this is a book about told from the perspective of being a Giants fan. I'm not an insider, I'm a fan and a scholar. And my journey as a fan, Charles has been with me pretty much every step of the way. So he's implicitly part of the story as well. Um, I just wanna mention, this is the book, San Francisco, uh, The Giants and Their City. I put in the chat, the link to, if you wanna buy it on the, um, at Kent State, which is the publisher, you get directly from them. There's a coupon there. I think the coupon says something like baseball 
It's not the most top secret coupon in the world, but it gets you a little bit of a discount. You can also get it at wherever you buy books online or anything like that. But if you just want to keep it simple, uh, you can go to Kent State. Um, I mean, go to Kent State Press online. So I, I, there's a couple things I'm doing in this book and a couple of reasons I kind of wrote this book. First of all, this book is about the Giants on and off the field during the period from 1976 to 1992. And the reason for those... Uh, that's bookended by that is yes, it is the Bob Lurie years when Bob owned the team, but it's also the story begins with them moving to Toronto and ends with them moving to Tampa. And those of you who are particularly astute are saying, wait a minute, they never actually left. And they didn't. And, and for that, I, I can't imagine, uh, I, I'm the only, I think we're all grateful for that, but it was that close. It, it really almost happened. And, and it was treated in the media as it was a done deal. So I wanna kind of explore that um, I also am fascinated by this idea. It's easy to write a book about being a fan of the Yankees in the 1950s, right? Or another team, you know, that's the, the Yankees in the late 90s. But, but for most baseball fans, our journey with our team includes decades where the best that happens is you, you get a pennant. You know, the best that happens is a couple playoff appearances, particularly in the older system when not every team made the playoffs. And that is, those are the stories that the on the field stories that are kind of forgotten but for many fans are most imprinted upon us. So that's, the, that's why I wanted to write this book about this period. I think a lot of that comes across. Um, it's also kind of a fascinating period in, in, in San Francisco history. The San Francisco that we know today was really, wasn't, it was a different city back then. This was a time when the city had probably two or 300,000 fewer people, when there was not nonstop traffic jams all the time. Uh, and when the story begins and there wasn't, there was barely enough money in town to keep the giants here. And we're gonna get into that in more detail. And I certainly get into that in more detail in the book. Just one other th thought uh, before I get to kind of the meat of this, I finished this book during the pandemic. And once you've done your research, a pandemic is not a bad time to write a book because you're home, there's not a lot else to do, uh, plenty of opportunity to write, uh, especially if you don't have young kids and I do not anymore. But it's not a great time to promote the book. You know, they're, they're, the market for this book is San Francisco. I'm in New York. I'm hoping to get out there this summer. But so I would just urge you, you know, spread the word about the book, buy it online, buy it if you, if your bookstores are letting you in in the Bay Area, tell people about it, Father's Day is coming up and all of that. So let's go back to the mid 1970s to kind of get into the meat of this book. And that's when this book begins. And we're talking about the years here, about 74, 75 with the San Francisco Giants. And there's a couple things to think about that team. Um, none, of, none of which are particularly good. The team on the field during this period wasn't terrible. They were 500 or a little bit below 500, but there were some real problems. In 74 and 75, they were last in the National League, and I have to check, but basically last in all of baseball in attendance. Nobody was going to these baseball games. Um, within a, about 18 month period in the early 1970s, they either traded, sold away or released four future Hall of Famers, four future Hall of Famers. And each one is kind of an interesting case. Willie Mays was traded to the Mets for Charlie Williams, who was, could charitably dis be described as a journeyman uh, relief pitcher. But it was a trade that happened because Stoneham couldn't afford to pay Willie Mays. And it was almost like he was going back to the Mets as kind of center fielder emeritus. And it allowed him to finish his career in New York where he was beloved. And he actually had, had a pretty good year in 73 when they won the pennant and almost won the World Series. Uh, Juan Marshall had kind of come to the end of the road and, and was released and ended up in Boston and then kind of in the most uh, kind of dissonant visual we can imagine with the Los Angeles Dodgers before retiring. Uh, and the two ones that kind of upset me the most, Gaylord Perry, who was still very much on top of his game, was traded for sudden Sam McDowell, who was very much not on top of his game and was struggling with arm injuries and substance abuse. And they got essentially nothing in return. And then Willie McCovey, was sent to the Padres and had, you know, McCovey, McCovey played his entire career in uh, pitchers' ballparks. And if he'd, if he'd played in, in, for the Boston Red Sox, he probably would have had 700 home runs or something. But he ended up having a few decent years in San Diego and then, and then as we know, came back. A couple of other things about this period. The farm system began to dry up. And remember, well into the early 70s, the Giants' farm system was so good that they could kind of trade George Foster, uh, you know, for Frank Duffy 
And in the short term, it didn't really hurt them, right? They could trade Dave Kingman in the short term. It didn't hurt them. They kept producing these guys, Bobby Bonds, Gary Maddox, Gary Matthews, so many great outfielders. But by this period, it begins to dry up. So 75, John Montefusco wins the rookie of the year. There's one or two good prospects in the organization, but it's beginning to slow to a trickle, which by the late 70s, it really hurts the team. Um, a couple of other things. The ballpark was Candlestick Park, and it was terrible. And I want you to just put a pin in that because we're going to spend a little bit of time in Candlestick. And, and, and there's a lot about Candlestick in the book, a lot of which you, you may have seen before, and a lot of people talking about it in ways that I hadn't seen before. A couple of other things that are harder to... Uh, to really characterize Stoneham has basically run out of money. The Stoneham family owned the team for at that time, almost 50 years. And the money wasn't there and the interest wasn't there. And he wasn't a San Franciscan who was, you know, committed to the city that way. The other thing that's kind of the harder, harder to describe is that it was not part of the gestalt of the city. Being a Giants fan in San Francisco in the mid seventies and even into the early eighties, but certainly at this time, this was some weird thing that was going on in the Southeast corner of the city in a city that probably more than any other in the United States was changing due to the kind of political and cultural and social changes, baseball was left behind in San Francisco. I talked to a lot of people for this book and for year zero who said, you know, I came out here usually from the East Coast and I'd been a baseball fan back home, but I kind of forgot about it for 20 years. And, and there was so much happening and baseball wasn't part of that. So, and then January of 1976 rolls around. Now, a couple of things happened very important in the early part of that year. In late uh, December of 1975, there was a very contested and very heated runoff election uh, for mayor of San Francisco in which George Moscone defeated John Barba Gelada. Moscone will get to, actually I'm writing a biography of Moscone, so if you really want to get to Moscone, you're going to have to wait a few years. Barba Gelada was kind of a proto Giuliani type, but without the polish. And, and this, the election ended with uh, Moscone winning by 4,400 votes and Barbara Gelada sending people in to storm the board of elections. Stop me if that sounds a little familiar. Anyway, Moscone campaigning as a progressive Democrat comes into office and the day before his inauguration, and this is all in the, uh, in the book, I, I quote some of this, the Toronto newspapers are running headlines, we get major league baseball. Remember the Blue Jays hadn't come around yet. We have, we're getting a major league team. And then they were running articles in the Toronto Star, things like, here's where they're going to play. Here's how much the tickets will cost. Some tickets will be as cheap as a dollar. Will they, will we, should we fire Wes Westrom and get a new manager? Uh, they were saying, well, look, the Pirates and Phillies are obviously the two best teams in the National League East, but the Giants could finish third. It was not something they were speculating about the team coming. It was done. And the San Francisco papers are running the opposite of that, which is, oh my God, we're losing our team. So a mayor who comes in with this, broad progressive agenda is kind of smacked in the face with, you know, you can't be the guy that loses the Giants, even though it's probably Joe Alioto's fault more than Moscone's. It was going to land on Moscone's plate. Moscone, by the way, lifelong sports fan, all city basketball player, didn't want this to happen. And that's where the book begins. And when this happens, Moscone has to do two things to keep the Giants in San Francisco. He has to buy time because they want to do this quickly. And he has to find the money. Now, he has to get $8 million. That's how much it was going to cost to, to, to match the offer of the Labatt Brewing Company, a beer brewing company that was going to take them, the Canadian Beer Brewing Company was going to take them to Toronto. And fortunately for the Giants, Bob Lurie had kind of been thinking about buying the team anyway. So he moved very quickly. He got in contact with the mayor's office and he said, I'm in. Now, if you know much about Bob Lurie, the Lurie fortune, Bob, Bob as, my, as my late father would say, Bob Lurie made his money the old fashioned way, he inherited it. Uh, Louis Lurie was, had made an enormous amount of money in real estate in Chicago, but primarily in San Francisco. He was very active in the kind of civic leadership, philanthropy of the city. But he was dead and Bob was now running the, uh, Bob was now running the business. I think somebody is unmuted maybe, we're getting a little feedback here. I think Jimi Hendrix has hijacked our Zoom meeting. Um, anyway, so, so Bob, uh, but he, it was cost, and, and also if you're in the real estate business in San Francisco, which is a good business that right now, I mean, it's gonna get better, but you can't move your business, right? It's not like a, a factory. So what was good for San Francisco was gonna be good for Lurie's bottom line and his real estate. So he was, it was a reason to believe this guy was committed to keeping the team. However, 
he only wanted to could come up with four million dollars. Now he needed another four million dollars, and he couldn't get it. I want you to imagine, even if that four million is forty million in today's dollars, that the wealthiest people in San Francisco, when contacted by one of their own, right? Not somebody like, you know, you or me who maybe doesn't have $4 million or $40 million to spare, but by a member in very good standing of the business elite, he couldn't raise the $4 million. He, in, in his words, everybody was out to a very long lunch. He would call, he wouldn't get his call in return. And Bob Lurie was well-liked. He wasn't some pariah socially or anything like that. Bob Short, who had been the disastrous owner of the Texas Rangers after the second iteration of the, of the senators who moved to Texas, he offered to meet the other four, but the two of them had a falling out because basically the National League said, well, he can be a silent partner. And Bob Short, who was kind of a poor man's George Steinbrenner, was never going to be a silent partner. So it looks like the deal is going to fall through. And at the very last minute, Bud Herseth, who was a cattleman from Arizona, comes in and says, I'll buy the team. And he puts in the $4 million, and he knows less than nothing about baseball. So he would say things like, well, if the pitchers only pitch every fourth day, meaning the starting pitchers, shouldn't they, I don't know, play outfield or something in the days in between? That's not really, maybe that works in high school. It's not really how you run a major league team. And, and it became clear to Lurie in the National League that something had to be done. So Bob bought him out the following year for four and a half million dollars. If you're keeping score at home, Herseth made half a million dollars, you know, a 12% on his investment, which, you know, isn't bad if you can get it. So the team is now in San Francisco. Lurie is committed, but they're still stuck in Candlestick Park. And, um, it, they're, they're kind of two characters that run through this entire book. One is Bob Lurie and the other is Candlestick Park. So I'm just curious, those of you who are on the video, which is most of you, could you either physically raise your hand or put the raised hand icon in the screen if you went to a night game at Candlestick, a night baseball game at Candlestick Park? Good. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing it. Uh, for the handful of you who have not, um, just say, think of everything you've read about it. It was worse. Um, and, and I will just say this, I'm, as you may have known from my work, I'm kind of half in New York, half in San Francisco. And I grew up in San Francisco, but my family was all here in New York. So every winter, we would fly to New York during what, what, uh, what, what, what's known as winter break or Christmas break to visit my grandparents, my aunt, my uncle, my cousins, all of that kind of thing. And I would dress for, you know, going to Central Park with my cousins in December the same way I would dress for, yes, Charles, exactly. I would dress for a night game at Candlestick Park in August. I mean, it, except for I didn't have like my cousin's ill-fitting, you know, winter boots, but basically the same. It was that cold. Also, they, they, they shared the ballpark with the 49ers, which meant the outfield was torn up a lot in the second half of the season. Uh, Will Clark told me a story. And Will Clark, I mean, a, a great player, but also a, a great defensive first baseman, which is often overlooked in the oeuvre of, of Will Clark as a ball player that he, he told me a story where he's chasing a foul ball, you know, into behind first base and kind of right field. I think it was a foul ball and it lands. He doesn't get to it. He picks it up on a bounce just to throw it back into the pitcher and it's got green paint on it. And the reason is the 49ers had torn up the outfield and the grounds crew just kind of sprayed green paint on the ground. That's the kind of ballpark it was. The Giants were never going to thrive in San Francisco playing in this ballpark. So for all of this period, this question of will the Giants leave? Where will they play? What's going to happen was, was front and center. You know, you'd be, you'd be reading the, the Sporting Green, which was the, um, you know, the, the, the Chronicle sports section, San Francisco Chronicle sports section, for those of you who aren't from the Bay Area, in the offseason. And you're wondering, you know, are they going to trade? Are they going to make a free agent signing? And half the Giants articles would be where they're going to play next year. And every opening day, you'd be kind of relieved and surprised that they were still in San Francisco, although not crazy about them still being a candlestick park. So they explored what to do. And some of the options they considered early on was doming it. And they decided that doming it was too expensive and it probably would have been too expensive. And I'm gonna get into some of this in more detail. It's in great detail in the book. Uh, they, there are four ballot initiatives. In 1987, at around 7th and Townsend, which is in the Petrero Hill area to build a ballpark. And that ballot initiative lost in substantial part because the leading candidate for mayor, a progressive Democrat named Art Agnos, was against it. For all the reasons progressive Democrats are always against this kind of thing. And Agnos was against it. And Agnos won. In, he won. 
And there was a lot of Agnos no on the ballpark. And, and, and there was one of the reasons Agnos was it wasn't the right place. And when I talked to people who were involved in this decision for the Giants, they kind of conceded it wasn't the right place. Two years later, they come up with this idea uh, to put the ballpark. This is in 1989. And this is a crazy place for a ballpark for those of you who are from San Francisco. But if you can imagine the corner of like 3rd and King Street, um, that's where they wanted to put the ballpark. That initiative would have passed probably if not for the earthquake, which we'll talk about, which you all know about. Um, but that, that failed too. And, and, that, and that time Agnes was mayor and was supporting it. And after that, the, they begin to look in earnest to move down the peninsula. Now I am, there is, I'm, I'm enough of a San Franciscan to say San Franciscans are maybe besides New Yorkers, the most provincial people in the world. And, um, and, and, and I talked to three mayors, either two in person and Diane Feinstein over email about this. I, for obvious reasons, you know, there were four mayors this time, Moscone was assassinated, so we can talk to him. And all of them basically said that, well, moving to Santa Clara, they might as well move to Florida, right? And, and, and I think to capture that, if you're from the Bay Area, you can't appreciate that, but that is how San Franciscans think. And I will tell you a true story because you happen to me on the call here. Many years ago, I would say roughly 1993 or 1994, uh, a, a mutual friend of Charles uh, Frocky, Charles Waverhand, so everyone can see you, and I had a bachelor party, I was, was getting married. And Charles and I were going to go to the bachelor party along with a couple of other friends. And he was living in San Jose with this woman and we were gonna, that he, his wife now, and, and that, you know, they're getting married. So he, he, he sent us, he told me the address on the phone because there's no email back then of the, the bar in, in Santa Barbara, it's like a sports in San Jose where we we're gonna meet. And I was driving and, and we get in the car and it's Charles and I think Charles, I think it was like Will Lowry and John Mashnow, you know, two other friends. And, and I pick everyone up and we look around each other and where are we going? And none of us knew. We literally did not know the way to San Jose. And between us, we'd lived in San Francisco 80 years, right? So, so, that's, so, so moving down the peninsula was not something that, that people wanted. And in 1992, just to put a kind of, a, to end the story of the ballpark, the, to, by the end of the 1992 season, all of the national newspapers, the sporting news, the New York Times are reporting the Giants are going to Tampa. And once again, a new mayor, first year in office, doesn't want narrow, wins a very narrow election, Frank Jordan, who defeated Art Agnos, and there's some great Frank Jordan stories in the book. He helps put this deal together. So that's, those are the bookends, but that's the off the field story. It's only some of it, but that's, I want to spend a little time on the field because this is a baseball uh, event. And, and the, the team that Bob Lurie bought in 1976, you know, was a 500 team. They were a mediocre team. You know, the Count, John Montefusco. Um, I will say this. I interviewed John Montefusco for this book. And I met him in New Jersey, which is where he's from, where he was house-sitting for somebody. And the place was filled with Yankee memorabilia. And I go in, and he's got Fox News blaring. <laughs> and this is like the middle of the Trump era. And, and I don't know if you know my other work, but I, I would say that my political views don't line up with the kind of Fox News direction. And, um, and he had it on and he said to me, I got Fox News, like as we were starting, I got Fox News on, I hope you don't mind. Now I knew what he was doing. So I just very politely said, as long as I can hear the recording, it's fine. And then he turned it down. But the count was, had been rookie of the year, was this kind of colorful star pitcher who, you know, probably ran his mouth too much, but it helped get people to the extent anyone could into the seats. There were some good young players on that team, Gary Matthews, Chris Spire, who they probably should have kept. Um, and, and, but the team was a 500 team. 77, uh, the 76, 77 off season is one of the most interesting in baseball history. It's the first year of free agency. And if you remember that off season, among the free agents who were available, the first year of real free agency, Bobby Gritch, I'm just naming names almost at random, Don Baylor, Joe Rudy, Sal Bando, Reggie Jackson, Raleigh Fingers, Gene Tennis. These are, you know, the, the very great players. And the Giants, they don't really know what to do. And, and they don't land any of those big names. However, dollar for dollar in 1977, the best free agent signing was the one made by the Giants. And they brought, it was because they brought Willie McCovey back on a very modest contract. And he, out, he was a better hitter in 77 than Joe Rudy, than, uh, than Don Baylor. I mean, not than Reggie Jackson or Bobby Gritch, but he was a real, probably the best hitter on the Giants team in 77. And when I asked Lurie about this, 
he said it was a baseball decision. And I attribute that to Bob being a very good spirited person who, and, and when we spoke, McCovey had recently passed away. It was only in part a baseball decision. It was also a decision on, on the Giants part to rebuild a relationship between the fans and their history in San Francisco. McCovey stuck around till 1980. And if you were like me, didn't have the good fortune to see Willie Mays just because I wasn't quite old enough and because of you know whatever, family reasons, McCovey was that connection to the past. And McCovey, unlike Mays, never played in New York. And as hard as it is to believe now, well into the 1990s, Willie McCovey was more beloved in San Francisco than Willie Mays. But the reason for that is because they brought him back and he played four years and it was really wonderful. But it was wonderful, but they still weren't good, right? They also made a great trade for Daryl Evans, who, in my view, might be the most underrated player in baseball history. So 1978 rolls around, and this is the first good Bob Lurie team. And, and I'm always struck by when I talk to Giants fans in their 50s, this team means so much to them. I wrote extensively about them in year zero. So if you want to deep dive in the 78 Giants, you check that book out. But the highlight of that 78 season, and I want to show this because I think there's some poignancy to it. And... Um, I'm never quite 100% sure how to get the screen share working. So um, give me a second here. Uh, hold on. That's, that's an article from the Bay Guardian from 1975. Uh, hold on. All right. So tell me when you can see this. So, can you see this in the screen share? I'm not seeing anything yet. There we go. It's starting to come up. There we All right, go. Can you see this? We got YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, so this is May of 1978. It's the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. The Giants have been in first place for a while. And Mike Ivey, who I talk about extensively in this book, because Mike Ivey was a guy who struggled with mental illness at a time when that was just dismissed as weakness and not being a team player. And it really hurt a career of somebody who was asked to do the wrong things in his career, Mike Ivey. Mike Ivey's best position was hitter. If he'd been in the American League for most of his career, he would have been, you know, a solid designated hitter and an all-star many years. But he, this is in the sixth inning of a game in May. And he is pinch hitting for Vic Harris, who might have been a worse player than Johnny LeMaster. So I'm just going to show this clip here, okay? And listen to the crowd. Okay, now, raise your hand if you were at that game. So a few of us, Charles and I were there together, a few of us. This, that was the biggest crowd to see a professional baseball game in the Bay Area history at the time. And it was a May game against the Dodgers. And, and I talked to Pat Gallagher, the longtime promotions person for the Giants, and in his words, you know, the place was th rocking. It was, he, he thought it was an earthquake, right? It was, I mean, it was, but... It's a May game against the Dodgers. It's May. And I think one of the reasons we were so excited is, first of all, we hadn't been around to contention for a long time. But secondly, we knew the Dodgers were the better team. And it pains me on a visceral level to say that. But we know that. And, but that was the, those were the kinds of years of the, early, of the early Bob Lurie era where, you know, being in the pennant race in June was exciting. Uh, and that 78 team had a lot of very good young players. Bob Nepper, uh, uh, Ed Halicki, Vita Blue, who was traded in one of the most important trades the Giants ever made uh, in, in the spring of that year. And we talked about that in the book. Jack Clark, uh, Ivy, of course, uh, Bill Madlock. And then for a whole lot of reasons, none of which are good, they never build on that nucleus. That, that team, I just want to make sure I have the next clip lined up properly, but that team, you thought going into 1979 that they would be you know, that they would be in contention. They fell apart in 79. Basically, if you look at the data, the pitchers just pitched too much, the starting pitchers. They were never healthy after that. Um, and then they fall into this funk uh, in 80 and 81. And they're kind of first half of 81. 81, of course, is that split season. They bring in Frank Robinson as the manager. They fire Joe Altabelli. Uh, and there's an interesting story there about how Robinson, who, as you know, is the first African-American manager in the American and the National League and how at least one other owner advised Lurie not to hire Robinson 
because and the other owners were, you wouldn't be able to fire him, meaning kind of a racist way of saying, you know, you can't fire the black guy uh, because you have the backlash. But Lurie went ahead and hi- fire, hi- hired him anyway and ultimately fired him. And in 82, they put together a team that only Frank Robinson would want. There's, you know, Reggie Smith, Joe Morgan, Dwayne Kuyper, and, you know, Daryl Evans at this point. <laughs> there's not a young person to be found other than Chili Davis, who was a great player. And they're in contention the whole season. And they end the year with three games at the stick against the Dodgers. And yeah, it was terrible. They lose the first two. And it's a three-game race uh, between the Braves, the Dodgers, and the Giants. And down in Atlanta, down in San Diego, the Braves are playing the Padres. And it comes down to the last game of the season, where if the Braves lose and the Dodgers win, no, excuse me, if, if the I think they were tied, the two teams are now tied. So the Braves, yeah, the Braves win. If they both win or both lose, there's a one-game playoff. And the Giants have been knocked out, thumped the night before, and we really thought we had a shot. It, was an, it wasn't as good. I mean, but the Braves or Dodgers were not exactly murderers row that year either. And, and I'm going to show you this next clip because this is about the seventh inning of that game between the Dodgers and the Giants. And I'll tell you one very funny story about this, um, but hold on. And, and, and uh, so watch this. And I want you to watch to the end. I'll freeze it on the screen, on the frame. So there's Frank Robinson. Okay, we'll just freeze on that because any Giants fan will enjoy that that image. <laughs> but again, when I, I talked to Larry Bear about this, and because this is this was the highlight between 1971 and 1987. And it didn't put us into the playoffs. It knocked the Dodgers out. So this is the ultimate. If we can't get anywhere, knocking the Dodgers out is the next best thing. But that's, again, that's the sign of a bad team. Not going anywhere, but, but at least we beat the Dodgers. And it was definitely, these were, but, but again, and again, I was at that game as well with Charles, but again, then the bottom fell out. 1983 to 1985, the Giants have the worst three years in a row of any Giants team since before John McGraw was the manager, right? So just think about that. Before John McGraw was the manager, it's not a team, not a sentence you hear a lot when talking about the history of this storied franchise. The team was terrible. It was, you know, they, they trade away Jack Clark, who goes on to have several more good years. It was a rotating, you know, prospects of the kind of Brad Wellman guys, Brad Wellman variety, who's Tom O'Malley, who simply were never going to be good enough. And then this endless stream of veterans who were just asked to do things they could no longer do. Gene Robertson, or Gene Richards, Al Oliver, Manny Trio, and they would make these moves. And you would just say, why? Not that it's not that Manny Trio was a bad player. If you needed a solid fielding backup second baseman on a good team, or an occasional left-handed bat off the bench, Al Oliver could be valuable, but they're not valuable now. And it was just terrible watching this. Um, but we did. But some good comes out of this period. And I'm going to share some good with that because, you know, I'm, I'm, and sometimes I'm an optimist. So again, does anyone know, does anyone have one of these? Right. So this, this is of course. Yes, I do. What? I do. Okay. So that is of course the quad candlestick. So raise your hand now that I can see you again, if you have one of those. And this was the promotion where they're still playing at Candlestick Park. It's still miserable. It's still freezing. So what do they do? They come up with this promotion, which is great. If you stay to the end of an extra inning game, you get this quad candlestick. And if you go to games now, I mean, some of you, I'm talking to Giants fans, you'll still see people with quads on their caps. But so it creates a buzz. It kind of makes something funny out of something tragic, which is how terrible the ballpark is. But I want you to think about the promotional value of this. Um, If you have cap day, and you get you know, some local company to sponsor giving away 20,000 ca- caps to the first 20,000 fans, you're going to get 20,000 people there, right? If you have you know, half price night or something, you know you can, you can schedule a half price night. But you can't do that. The, the logic doesn't work staying like, like, you don't schedule extra inning games. Well, now, due to the, the, the unending brilliance of Rob Manfred, we don't really have extra inning games anymore. But, but you can never schedule them. Right. So, of course, it's just a quirky thing. If you get one, you get one. 
So it didn't sell any extra tickets, but it began something important, which is understanding that the Giants are a different kind of team playing in a different kind of city and to build a relationship with San Francisco. So I would argue that two of my favorite, some of you may know that in the earlier part of the last decade, the Giants won three World Series. Does anyone know that? Some of you may have read that somewhere. And two of my favorite players from that run are Tim Lincecum and Sergio Romo. And those are kind of only in San Francisco type players, only with the Giants. Sergio Romo with the Yankees would have had to shave his beard, would have fought with uh, George Starbender. So you can imagine Lindsay coming on a team like, you know, the St. Louis Cardinals or something like that. So they're beginning to build this relationship. But nothing, when you're building that relationship, this is where it starts. Uh, hold on. Okay. Share. I'm sorry. This is where it starts. Okay, that was, of course, the crazy crab, which younger fans don't believe this was a real thing. They don't believe this actually happened. Now, now that, that commercial we saw, I, have a, I think I have a photo of you, Charles, with the crazy crab, but I can't see it right now. I can't reach it right now. But that, that, that commercial that you saw, what's the first line? Giants fans are different. And they begin to tell a story, Giants fans are different. Again, Larry Bear said, you know, the Giants are like an acquired taste, like punk rock or the Grateful Dead, which in San Francisco kind of resonates. So they're trying to kind of create that story. And the crab, now, if you know anything about San Francisco, you know, crabs are, if you keep kosher, you can, this isn't relevant, but you know, crabs are delicious. Different ethnic groups eat them in different ways. You know, now there's the crab sandwiches out in the center field when you can get to the game. But, but, and, and of course they're booing it, right? Because we're San Francisco, we don't like mascots. Mascots are too commercial. We boo our mascots. But it really did catch on. Of course, the team is still losing. The team lost 100 games. I mean, but, and I tell you, I was in high school then, and I had a friend, you know, who would see me in the hallway. You know, this is, tells you probably more about me in high school than anything else, and would sing and dance that crazy crab song, right? It did kind of catch on, but it was, it was part of the team and part of their image. And then something very strange happens. Towards the end of 85, Lurie loses it, fires the manager fires the general manager, and he brings in Al Rosen to run the team. And Lurie had wanted Al Rosen to run the team for a while. And there's a lot about Al Rosen in this book because he's kind of a fascinating character. And Rosen brings in Roger Craig. And since that time, the team was never a laughing stock again. Craig, Craig and Rosen tell the team, if you, wanna, if you think this place is too cold and worst place to play, go find somewhere else to play. So he's giving this lecture, Roger Craig, I don't want to hear anyone saying it's too cold. And Vita Blue, who was in his last year of what, you know, what, what, well, by 86, beginning his last year of which borderline Hall of Fame career says, but Roger, it is cold here, right? But, you know, Vita Blue was Vita Blue, but they began to say, we're going to make this our advantage. I, I, I want to just talk about this period a little bit because this really begins opening day 1986 in the Houston Astrodome. Nolan Ryan on the mound for the Astros. And again, I want to go back to Will Clark because I think he's instrumental in this. Will Clark leads off the game with a home run. And from that moment on, the Giants were a new franchise. 87, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the 87 playoffs for, for obvious reasons, um, but they pushed the Cardinals to game seven. And I will tell a personal story here. This was, and imagine the first time they've been in the playoffs since 1971. When, back when you had to win the division to get in the playoffs, you could go that long. And they, they were a better team than the Cardinals. They would have beat the, both Corey Bush and Bob Lurie promised me they would have beaten the Twins in the World Series that year. I don't know that you, what you can do with that promise, but they did assure me of that. Um, and I was in college, and I was taking what they now call a semester abroad, and I was studying in China, in Beijing. And I was, I don't know how I kept up with this, but I calculated what I thought would be half an hour after game seven. And I needed to know who won, so I called Charles at his mom's place because they were I didn't know where else to reach him, no cell phones. And his mom and he, he and his mom, who's his late mother, are, pat, are watching the game together. And she picks up the phone and starts saying, how are you? And Charles is like, and Charles kind of grabs the phone from her and says, they lost. Not hello, they lost. 
And I said, oh, sh and then I said, I got to go. This is super expensive. And I hung up the phone. That was our only phone call for my six months in China with my oldest friend. But, but somehow through Charles's inge ingeniousness, that interchange ended up in Herb Cain's column the next day, which was you know, the highlight of that playoff series for me. Two years later, they make it back. And this is the team. And this, the 89, there are certain years in San Francisco where everything kind of comes together. And 89 is one of them. Giants make it all the way back to the playoffs. They again go up three games to one. They're losing. Again, th this is a game. There's about 58,000 people at Candlestick Park, 50,000 of whom have better seats than Charles and I. This game was played on, on Yom Kippur, which was how I got initially got the day off work. But then I told them that my particular brand of observance, I don't work on high holidays, but I do go to playoff games. And, um, and they're losing in the bottom of the eighth inning. And again, two outs, nobody on. Candy Maldonado draws a, raw, a walk. And at this point, we're thinking, oh, good, because Clark and Mitchell will now come up in the bottom of the ninth. But now they get two more walks, and there's a seal on every rock, and Will Clark comes up. And I would, I could, would, posit, I I would argue that this is the second most important hit in franchise history other than the shot heard around the world. Here is uh, Will Clark against Mitch Williams, who was kind of the toughest left-handed reliever in baseball that year. You're not sharing it, Lincoln. Oh, shit. Sorry, let me, let me, let me share that. Sorry about that. All right, here's Mitch Williams, best left-hand reliever in baseball that year. Line drive, base hit. In comes one. In comes Butler. Going to third is Thompson. Three to one, San Francisco. Now, Unfortunately, there's no video with Hank Greenwald making the call because Greenwald's line was Superman has done it again. Will Clark had an awesome NLCS that year. We'll talk about that in the book. Um, and, and the Giants are back in the World Series for the first time since 1962. So there are people uh, at, you know, watching that World Series like me who've been fans for years who weren't alive, but who never seen the Giants in the World Series. And, and we're not going to talk about that world now. And, and the World Series was ugly. They lost the first two games. And we all know what happened in game three. We all know what happened in game three shortly before the game started, which was the earthquake. And I, in the book, I have a lot of detail of various people, Agnos, Lurie, a bunch of different players, coaches, talking about how they experienced the earthquake. I'm not going to go into that here, but I will tell you one story, which I'm only going to tell if you promise me it won't stop you from buying the book, because it's a very good story. Um, but... So as you know, they couldn't play game three because the, the, the damage from the earthquake and they weren't sure what to do. And the, the focus was on making sure everyone was okay in the Bay Area. Remember, they're playing the A's across the Bay. So, you know, Oakland was hit just as hard as San Francisco, harder in some ways. And what are they going to do? Well, the commissioner at that time was a guy named Faye Vincent, who I don't know why he was commissioner of baseball. I get Barchi Amati had died, but like why, it's not clear to me why Faye Vincent was commissioner of baseball. And he called a meeting because he wanted to discuss this with, with the city of San Francisco and the Giants. So at the meeting were Lurie, Art Agnos, Corey uh, Bush, and Al Rosen. Now, if you know anything about these people, Corey is staff, and he's vice president, but he's not the principal in the meeting. Neither is Rosen. Lurie is, and Agnos is. And if you know anything about this meeting, these guys, Agnos is kind of, regardless of political views, Agnos is kind of a touchy, hothead kind of guy, and Lurie is a very mellow, more easygoing kind of guy. And Faye Vincent says, so when do you want to restart the World Series? I'd hate, I'd, and, and, and Agnes says, we're not ready to start the World Series again. And he says, well, I'd hate to be the first mayor where we had to cancel the World Series. And Agnos says, because he's such an easygoing guy, because in his worlds, I now feel threatened. And he says, well, I'd hate to start the World Series while we're still looking for dead bodies. So he's right. And then Faye Vincent comes up with, you know, this genius idea. And he says, well, listen, why don't, maybe we, I think we should move it to San Diego. So first pennant in 27 years, they haven't played one game in Candlestick Park in San Francisco. And he wants to move it to San Diego. Now, those of you who I don't know have ever looked at a map or been to California know that San Diego is not exactly, it's not like saying we're gonna move it to San Jose, right? It's a whole different market. And at this point, you can imagine, Agnos is about to explode. 
But before he can do that, Bob Lurie pounds his fist on the table and says, and, and, and Lurie, I gave a talk to the New York Giants Preservation Society where Lurie was on the call and he again confirmed that I was telling about the story right. And I've heard from multiple sources and he stands up and he says, over my goddamn dead body, are you moving this World Series out of San Francisco? After all we've done, after what all these fans have been through, we're finishing it, we're playing it here. And fin Vincent back down. And that was, you know, Lurie is an important person in Giants history. And that may have been his finest moment other than keeping the team here in 1976. Um, I'm not going to talk about the final two games of that World Series for obvious reasons. And, and, and we already talked about what happened, you know, with the, with the initiative, except to say that there's now this feeling, and you felt it at the time, that the Giants have been delivered three blows in a row. First, the, the, the earthquake, then getting swept, and then losing the ballot initiative. And you just had this feeling that it's not going to work here in San Francisco. And that was the feeling going into the early 90s, despite having some very good teams. But of course, it ended differently. So I know, I know I've talked for a long time, and there are probably questions, but I just want to wrap up by saying that this is a forgotten period in Giants history. And it's kind of a forgotten period in San Francisco history, but you can't understand the Giants of today without going back and thinking about this period, right? First of all, they wouldn't be here. They came this close to leaving twice in ways that we couldn't imagine today. And secondly, they really began to build an image as not just another baseball team. And even when they, they, they really, for the first half of you know, the 2010 to 2014 run, which was just glorious, they did it in a way that was different. And I, I remember thinking at the time when they lost the 2002 World Series, which was heartbreaking, that, that, you know, I didn't, I, I, as, and, I'm, and I'm a Barry, Barry Bonds loyalist, but it didn't feel like a team that I had connected with that way. Um, and, and it wasn't because of Bonds, it was because a lot of those players, they didn't have, they didn't, they feel like the San Francisco team, but guys like Romo and Lincecum and even Sandoval, these are guys who, you know, Sandoval never would have made it out of the minor leagues in a lot of organizations because he was too plump, right? So, so, and that started here. It starts with bringing back Willie McCovey and it goes to kind of nutty things like the crazy crab and the qua and bringing in people like Al Rosen who really changed the feel of the team. Anyway, I've talked for a long time and now I can take questions or comments or however we're going to do that. Folks, you could go ahead and put your questions in the comment area, or you could also unmute yourself and ask a question that way. Just make sure to be respectful and not talk over one another. Link, can I just jump in here with a question? You've, yeah. you've kind of gotten at this, but I'd like you to amplify a little bit more. The, the connection between this image of the Giants is kind of a outlaw, you know, uh, uh, different kind of a, of a ball club, different kind of franchise with San Francisco's own cultural image as an iconoclastic different city. San Francisco is not Los Angeles. San Francisco is not New York. San Francisco is a unique animal. Can you, can you make that connection? Well, ironically, I was thinking if you were actually started a team today, you wouldn't necessarily feel that way, right? I mean, this is, this is in the, but the San Francisco in the 60s, 70s, and 80s really was unusual in almost in every imaginable way. Demographically, it was unusual, right? The city had a large, the, the city, at this was a time when most American cities were heavily, still heavily African-American or white. And the city had huge Asian-American populations, huge Latino population, obviously a huge gay population, right? So the kind of casual homophobia that, that is part, sadly this part of sports culture wasn't going to help in San Francisco, right? So they're one of the first teams to do the AIDS benefit and a, a ball game to raise money for AIDS. They, they, they did the first team to do the it gets better. It'll get better, but add a few years ago. Even now, they're the only team with a pride hat or the first team with a pride hat, right? So, and it just, I mean, and, and what was happening in the 60s and 70s is that the, 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 not, the, not the immigrants from other countries, but the migrants to, to San Francisco are not coming to make money in tech. They're coming because, how to say it, they're the weirdo in their community. And I'm weirdo, I say that in the most positive sense of the word, right? And it may be because, you know, they're gay and to paraphrase Harvey Milk or to borrow a line from Harvey Milk, they can't stay in San Antonio or Topeka or Wichita, right? But maybe they're not gay. Maybe they just like have different political views or different kind of music, or they're just running away from a, a, so, a culture that's not working for them back east or in the Midwest. And when you come that, baseball is associated with those conservative things you've left. And for newer San Francisco, it's hard to understand just how big a part of the culture it was at the time.
do you think we'll see teams move in the next decade? Um, so I'm answering Adam Stein's question in the, uh, in the chat. The short answer to that is I think to a large extent, it's extortion and posturing, and to a large extent, it works. You know, one thing to consider is that if you are Rob Manfred and your job is to make the rich owners richer, that, that expansion is a much better uh, way to do that because the, the expansion, the, 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 new, the new franchise fees are much higher. So Major League Baseball makes more money with a new franchise than with a team moving. The other problem, of course, is that there are, this isn't, you know, there was this, this, this raft of movements, team movement beginning really with, I mean, leaving the Expos to, to Washington out because that's the exception, but beginning uh, with the, the Browns and the Athletics uh, in the early part of the, of the 50s, really through, you know, the last, the movement of the, the, the second iteration of the Senators to Washington. And what was happening there was that the, the major league teams were ca catching up with the changes in population, right? It was obvious you had to have a team in Los Angeles. It was obvious you had, the team, had to have a team in the Bay Area and less obvious you needed two, right? Pretty obvious you needed a couple teams in Texas. But where are those markets now? I mean, it doesn't, you know, the A's are gonna go out and move to Las Vegas and three years from now they'll have the same problems. What about, the, what about, the, what about the Braves? Did the Braves spit? The Braves will get a new stadium, but they won't move to a new community. I mean, to a move to another state or something. They're just shaking down the, the Georgia for another stadium, another ballpark. I, what I mean is the move to, the move to Milwaukee uh, in, 50, in 53 from Boston. Does that fit into that? Does that um, fit into that? Yeah, who's talking? Because I can't see your face for some reason. I'm sorry. My, okay. my video's off. Okay. So the, the, the Braves moving to Milwaukee is part of that. But again, Milwaukee doesn't work because the population isn't, you know, they, well, look, when they had when independent every year with Eddie Matthews, Henry Aaron, of course, they're going to draw a lot of people, but they didn't right. last there. And, and again, Atlanta was a much bigger market by the time the mid 60s when they make the move. But there's no markets like that left. So, so, that's, so, so that's why I, don't, I think a lot of this is threats and, and, and extortion and, and just trying to show, what eight million does was the center. I don't know what the standard price was. I would probably 12 to 16 million is the number that, that rings a bell. I mean, there was, you know, the, the I didn't talk, I talked about him in the book, but not in this talk. Marvin Miller, uh, who was one of the most important non-players in the history of the game. And Marvin Miller was despised by these owners. He was, a, for, you know, he represented the, the MLBPA and he was, a, he was a leftist labor lawyer. But Marvin Miller made all of these owners richer. What free agency did and what Miller's did, what the MLBPA did under Miller's leadership was it brought more money into the game and that made all of them richer. So it, it is just such a bigger industry now. Ironically, it's a bigger industry that plays less of a role in our culture than it did 50, 60 years ago. Is that a, let me just check the chat here. Yes, 13 million. Yeah, so that's, I think, I think Maxwell, I think that's kind of the ballpark we're talking about. John Scully. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you know if Bud Hurst is still alive and whatever happened to him after he sold his interest to, to Bob Lurie? I have never heard about him. <laughs> well, I'm reasonably certain that I came across his obituary in doing research for the book. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I don't know what happened. He went back to Arizona. Yeah, I've I never mean, heard a peep out of him. <laughs> I mean, he like the other thing is that he told Bob that one of his favorite things to do was to go to the track. The racetrack, which is fine. People go to the racetrack, but you, it's not really, it doesn't work. It's not compatible with owning a major league baseball team, right? You know, you're really not supposed to, you know, the whole gambling thing. So baseball just wasn't his thing. I suspect he went back to Arizona and lived his life in, in extreme wealth until he died an old man, but I don't know. You're right. He's, and he's, and I think very few Giants fans know who Bud Herseth was. And he stepped in at the last minute. And, and I heard, um, you know, Corey Bush told the story because Corey has an interesting role in this because he was Moscone's press secretary. And then he went to go work for Bob Lurie because he's a huge baseball fan. And he told me that he'd grown up a Dodgers fan in Los Angeles, but he traded in his Dodger blue for Giants green. And now he's a lifelong Giants fan. But he said that they were, you know, he came back from a lunch and he said, I'm getting calls from people in the Richmond district saying, I'm, I'm, I'm emptying my piggy bank and sending it to you. Don't let the Giants go. Right. And he gets a call and, and no, no, Moscone gets a call. No, he's called, called this guy back. He's called Bud Herseth. And he calls 
And and so and then he realizes that he this guy's real, and he transfers the call to Moscone, the mayor. And Moscone's like, get in here, write this down, like check out, make sure he's like, they never heard of this guy. He came out of nowhere. He believed there was some real estate involved, and he wasn't Herseth did, and he thought he was getting that real estate in Arizona near where the Giants train, but it wasn't part of the deal. But then he just brought it anyway. He was there for a year. He made his money, and he went back to his his life, which I assume he included eating a lot of steak because he was a cattle rancher. I just toss in a quick Bud Herseth story here. Yes. Uh, Lurie and Herseth, of course, had never met. All they they made the deal over the phone, literally in a matter of minutes, because it was a deadline they had to meet. So they they you know they went ahead and did it. They'd never met. So after they 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 bought the team, Herseth invites Lurie down to Arizona to meet face to face, and ingratiates himself with Lurie by by uh, taking him out into the desert at night in Herseth's pickup truck, get drunk and shoot jackrabbits. And you can just imagine Bob Lurie thinking, what in the world have I gotten myself into? <laughs> they they weren't compatible, those two. Yeah, I mean, Bob was was a very urban guy. I mean, he was not going out to pick up for you. He plays a lot of golf, right? But that's about it. For, for, for That's about as rural as it gets for Bob. You're very lucky that you didn't get Bob Short uh, uh, in with the Giants there because that man, I'm calling him from Minneapolis, so um, and and he is despised here even after his death over goodness, you know, 30 years ago. So, but, but that man ticked off Minneapolis with moving the Lakers, and he also ticked off Washington D.C. with moving the Senators, so too. And um, he would have been a very bad business partner for uh, Bob Lurie. It would have been a disaster. And, and the National League owners who had to approve it were, the, what, what broke down the deal is that they said, we will only approve it essentially if Lurie is the, speaks for the franchise, not Short. And, and Short wanted to be equals and, and it just fell apart. But, but the National League, for a lot of the reasons you're talking about, Robert, like they didn't want this guy. And, 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 and her said it was the same thing. The National League said, you know, we want Bob, I mean, Lurie, I mean, you know, I don't have, I mean, Bob, obviously enormously wealthy man and he's in that world and people knew him and they trusted him and, and he was like them. And, you know, so, so he was the one that kind of ran the interference for her. So. Maxwell. Yes. Uh, we've all seen that famous picture of George Moscone in the seventies plaid jacket, throwing out the first ball on opening day at Candlestick Park. Is there any evidence of Harvey Milk being a baseball fan or his involvement with the Giants? Um, so that is not opening day because in opening day, 1976, there was a strike and he didn't cross the picket line. That was actually a few days later. Um, I have spoken to friends of Harvey Milk who were, who were main big giant. I have, Harvey Milk and I have a, well, he's, I'm friendly with somebody who was close with Harvey Milk. She was from the East coast and a lifelong Giants fan. I, I've talked to several people who are now in their 70s who have told me they'd be, or you know, late 60s, 70s, that they became Giants fans in 1951. And I can't for the life of me figure out why. But anyway, she became, I'm joking, of course we can figure out why, right? But she became a Giants fan and she was a, a, also a, remains a big, lives in the Bay Area, remains a big Giants fan. She never mentioned, and we talk about Harvey Milk a lot, she never mentioned any interest by Milk on Milk's part in baseball. <laughs> now, having said that, Milk was only on the board of supervisors for 11 months. Um, he certainly didn't do anything to to hurt the Giants, and had it. He was always going to vote with Moscone on a major thing like that, anyway. Basically, now Milk was not on the board of supervisors in '76. He got on in '78. All right. Any other? Let me see. Check the chat because I know people are writing stuff. Short is hated in DC. Thanks, Maxwell. Yeah, I, I, Adam, I kind of agree with you about Montreal, and I, and and on a, on a, I would love to see a team in Montreal because not least because I'm not that far, and Montreal's a great city. Although I would recommend going there in the summer months. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Montreal could work. I mean, in my in this book, hold on a second. Oh, I don't have it here. But in my book, Will Big League Baseball Survive, which is a uh, a Temple University Press 2016, I talk about that the only markets that are really sustained major league baseball teams are outside the country, which would force major league baseball to really rethink a lot of things. And that might be the next frontier, but you should probably go back and read that book uh, to get my, my further thoughts on it, my deeper thoughts on that. Uh, Lincoln, I have a question for you. Uh, I'm not 
I, I haven't read your new book, so I don't know. Does Bill Graham uh, and his concerts, uh, Day on the Green concerts at all figure in your 80s well, narrative? Well, not not in this book. Bill Graham's concerts were in Oakland, not at the stick. For the yes, most. and that's my that's my yeah. that's an interesting decision he made. Also, because remember, and, and, and the weird thing about so so the weird thing about the, the Coliseum is that this this weird thing about the A's saying they want to get out of the Coliseum, which is not a great ballpark. We've all been there, but the location is fantastic, particularly for the A's. Oakland's not big enough, right? You, I mean, I mean the Yankee Stadium. It's the closest ballpark to me. I don't know if ever have you ever been to Yankee Stadium. Most of you, um, if if you're in Midtown Manhattan, which I don't recommend, but if you're in Midtown Manhattan, you can get to the Yankee Stadium in half an hour, right? So so in the, it's close to the, the the center of the city. But if you're in Oakland, you can't put up. You have to have it close to different. Oh, Bart, obviously, and there's a Bart stop right there, but also these highways. So it connects Oakland to a, the ball, the team to a broader kind of range of fans. So that location is very good for the A's. I think that's the same reason it's very good for the day on the green. Charles is smiling because we went to several days on the green together as well. Um, I did find, I, I will say this, I, I did find in my research on the new book, which will be out God knows when, a note from Graham to Moscone uh, saying, you know, right after he got elected, congratulations and recommending somebody for security. Now, I didn't look into that person, but given who did security for for for, for Bill Graham, um, that's kind of an amazing. That, that's the thing about that, right? Because the Hell's Angels did his security, right? They're not going to do security for the mayor. Bill Graham is is an extraordinary, extraordinarily fascinating figure. We all know his his backstory, um, and 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 the reason I, I like uh, Bill Graham is that is that. One of the reasons is that is that he, Harvey Milk, and the punk rocker Joe Dirt from the band, us, uh, what was his band, the Fuck Ups, um, have the strongest New York accents of anyone in New York, in San Francisco, kind of culture, politics, whatever, in the 70s. But the fourth place would be my mother. Um, so so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I like Bill Graham from that. And of course, I liked his, uh, but he was a fascinating guy. He also, um, I talk about him in year zero because how the punk rockers hated him. But they didn't have the self-awareness to know that what that they hated him. He he wouldn't like if you're going to wear swastikas on your jacket, like maybe the guy who fled the Nazis isn't gonna promote your shows. Like that seems to me like if you can't have the self-awareness to figure that one out, there's a problem. Um I, there's a couple of other questions in the chat I want to get to. Um what made May's beloved in San Francisco? Well, I mean, you know, Frank Condiff described San Francisco in the 60s as you know, this is a crazy town. They boo Willie Mays and they cheer Khrushchev. And Mays got a lot of criticism from Giants fans because he was just wasn't quite good enough to carry this team all the way. Over time, particularly after he retired, and I talked about this in the book, he was banned from baseball by Bowie Kuhn, who was in way over his head as commissioner of baseball. He, Uberoth lifted the ban, Lurie brought him back, and he really spent has spent the year since 1986 just being a, a well-liked figure, put, they, they put him in the right spots where he's, people love him. And he's, and he's been really committed to San Francisco in a lot of ways. And it just, and, and, you know, people recognize just how good he is, how great he was and what a good guy he is. So that's, that's had a lot to that. Tom, I very much agree with your, um, with your comments here in the chat. And I talk about uh, those in, in my last in the book year, uh, will baseball league, will big league baseball survive? Um, did the Giants have a five-year plan? Um, no, but they had a two-year plan in, in the last decade, Charles. I mean, no, it just kind of worked out that way. And, and I don't think 78 to 82 is five years. Well, but, but, but three years in between, 881, it's a four-year plan, like the Olympics, right? Or elections. All right. <laughs> it's five if you count both, yes. But when Stalin had the five-year plan, it was like 50, 22 to 27, right? Anyway, we're not going down that road. Any other questions? I think when we start talking about Stalin's five-year plan, the universe is telling. I, I've actually written several books on the former Soviet Union, so I, and I've been to his birthplace, so I could answer some questions if we want to go down that road. All right, so are there any other questions I haven't got? Have I gotten to everybody? I think you have. Thank you very much for your time today, Lincoln. This is Thank great. Um, like I said earlier, especially as a, a Giants fan who developed my love for baseball during that era, 
throwing out some of those additional insights was definitely something that was very interesting to me and very um, touching. And I, I really enjoyed it. And everybody make sure to get this book. Looking forward to tackling it. Um, picked it up about a week back. Um, thank you very much, Lincoln. Well, thank you. you great. It's always great to, uh, to speak to Sabre folks. and hope to see you be out there in person at some point. All right. Thanks a bunch, everybody. Have a great rest of your weekend. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.